one of the things that for me is most concerning about the current landscape is the fact that the purpose for education is hotly disputed. There is no real consensus amongst the policymakers or the politicians, or even, dare I say, amongst us as educators, as to what the purpose of education should actually be. And so, if you think about it, we hear all kinds of pronouncements from the department and others about the fact that we need to have skills for the workplace. And that is right and proper. But what that has meant in some secondary schools is that all of the vocational education has been thrown out of the window because we get into these kinds of situations where you get the polarised debate about whether it's academic or vocational and you get all of these stories about children or students doing um, courses that aren't going to lead anywhere and they usually pick something like basket weaving. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never come across a student who's done basket weaving yet. But you will hear that in these debates about these students doing courses that aren't going to lead anywhere and what we need is an academic education. Then, if you get a riot in one of our urban areas, it's not skills for the workplace that we need anymore from our education system. It's something that's about character building. It's something that's about nation building. It's something about building a sense of belonging, building a sense of citizenship. And what I'm saying is if we're not clear as educators about what the purpose of education is, irrespective of educational policy, irrespective of what Ofsted says, irrespective of what, dare I say, the Secretary of State for Education says, then we are in a dilemma. Often education seems to be about the neck up. It's all about the intellect. It's all about um, engaging people in gaining knowledge. It's not about the spirit. And it's very, very important for us to look at human beings and particularly ourselves as holistic beings if we're really going to make progress and be the kinds of people that we want to be, be as excellent, be as brilliant as we want to be. So I, I, I developed this, well, I used to call it a diagram. And then um, I started to do some work for the Institute of Education at the University of London. They made me a visiting fellow on the basis of the work that I did. And there were lots of people there drawing diagrams and calling them models. So here's my model. <laughs> and what this model is supposed to depict is that there is much more below our waterline than there is above. You will recognize it as the iceberg. And what I'm saying is that below our individual water lines is our upbringing and socialization. And that upbringing and that socialization gives birth to your values and your beliefs. And as a result of those values and beliefs, there's where your motivation comes for being and for doing. And I suppose what we're most in, uh, interested in is our behaviors as people in working within the education system and what it is we do. And what we're all searching for in order to feel content is that where we work and the work that we do is in sync with who we are. It's really, really simple. I'm just adding to some of the simple but profound messages that you got this morning. It's really simple. So if you get into an organisation where the organisation culture... And the organization culture is just another way of talking about its upbringing and its socialization, its journey. If there is at least some synergy between what that organization values, what motivates it to do what it is, to what, do what it does, its behaviors, if there's some synergy between the organization and where you are, then there's sufficient balance. I'm not saying that it's easy and I'm not saying that we don't go home tired. But we go home tired feeling I've done something worthwhile. I really, truly have made a significant difference today to somebody's life. But I grew up in a time when actually there wasn't much expected of black youngsters within the education system in, in Britain. I was fortunate enough to go to a school with a head teacher who felt very differently. And I think about Mr. Matthews all 
the time because he was just ahead of his time in terms of his thinking. Imagine 1960s primary school in Handsworth, 98% black African Caribbean kids, most of us of Jamaican heritage, many of us born here, but some having had come over from the Caribbean in that school. And Mr. Matthews had the highest expectations for all of us. When colleagues around him had a very, very different view about West Indian children and what was possible with them. And the reason that I say that was because I, I remember um, a, a conversation where um, I was called out of, of my class to go and, and, and meet with the head. I, I thought it was for some kind of prize because, you know, I was a good, good child and, you know, I was often getting prizes for, for verse speaking, as they called it back in the day then. Um, so I went along and to my surprise, my mother was there. My mother was in the office and um, Mr. Matthews explained to me and to mum that the reason that he'd asked her to come in is that she had selected the schools that um, I was supposed to be going to as a secondary school. Now, I remember she hadn't got a clue. So she'd just written down the first three schools that she could think of that was close to where we lived. And instead of Mr. Matthews being a job's worth and simply sending the forms off to the local authority. He looked at the form and he gave my mother a, a ring and he says, come in, we need to talk about this. And he said, no, 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 no. You need to cross out those three schools. You need to put King Edward's Grammar School at the top. And I remember my mum saying, is that a good school then, Mr. Matthews? And um, him saying, yes, Mary, I can, I can reassure you. It's, it's an excellent school. I can vouch for it. My daughter Claire goes there. And I remember as a little kid sitting in the head teacher's office thinking, the head teacher thinks I'm good enough to go to the school that his daughter goes to. And I'm going to grow up to be a teacher like that. I never thought I'd ever be a head teacher. But I, also, I did think I'd be a teacher like that who looked at other people's children and thought, whatever's good enough for my children is good enough for theirs. The logic of the system at the time was that West Indian children failed. And the vast majority of West Indian children that went to other schools in Hansworth, in Birmingham at the time, I can assure you, did not end up at King Edward's Rose Hill Road Grammar School. They did not end up there. Now, what was that about? It was about the difference that schools make. It was about the difference that leadership makes in terms of looking at the community that it serves and actually deciding we can create an, an alternative narrative to the so-called prevailing wisdom about what's possible with kids like these. We take it as a given that we expect kids to be able to be literate, numerate, IT competent when they leave our schools. We take that as a given as educators. But what else are we looking for from the education system? And I would suggest to you that to be an educated person, you have an unambivalent sense of self that has been reinforced through that educational process. And if there are children sitting in your classroom who don't see themselves reflected in any way, shape or form through the curriculum, through the experiences that they get in your school, if they don't have their identity affirmed in some way, then we're kind of missing the point. Because part and parcel of what it is to be educated is to have a confident sense of self and to love self. To be self-conscious, the notion of self-consciousness, often within Western thinking, is often negative. You know, she or he is too self-conscious. I would say that one of the things that is lacking within us as human beings it, today is that we are not self-conscious enough. And if we can get an educational offer that enlightens, brightens, lifts our sense of self, then it lifts our sense of what we are capable of, of what our potential is. And the other stuff, getting kids to read, is easy. 
after that. And if you think to yourself, oh, I'm not part of any tribe. Oh, yes, you are. We follow football teams, don't we? Part of a tribe. We're part of many, many clubs. Part of a tribe. You may be in a church, part of another tribe. You know, there are all kinds of aspects to our being that make us who we are. And one of the things that is joyous within a school setting is that at some points during a school week, we can touch all of our selves. Not in that way, lady, on the front row. That is not what I meant. And I arrived at precisely the right time, break time. Break time in any school is the best time to arrive. Whether you're Ofsted inspector, researcher, whatever you are, that's the time to arrive at the school. That's when you see the unveiled truth. <laughs> and almost on point, there was a rumble in the playground. Now, for those of you who don't know what a rumble is, what happens is that one of the kids shouts, Rumble! Everybody knows which kid they have to jump on. Don't ask me why. <laughs> they jump on top of this kid. You can hear muffled screams beneath this pile of human beings. I thought because it was a boys' school that it was some kind of male ritual, ceremony, bonding, whatever. And so I, I, I watched, as you do as a researcher. I did not intervene. And then enter stage left, a woman walking across the playground, little short white woman. And the fact that she's white and short is really important. Because this is a school in a rough part of London. Where is it again, sir? Yes, that place. <laughs> and this is, as I said, 70% black. Yeah? Boys, poor part of London. That just equates to trouble. So anyway, she enters stage left across the playground, three-inch heels, looking the business, and I'm thinking, ah, there we have it. The deputy head, yes? The woman behind the throne. It's not all about Mr. Wilshaw. Here we have it. And so she steps out across the, 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 to the, the, the rumble, child's voice underneath the pile of human beings getting lower and lower as we speak, and she says, you, 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 by name, just three boys, into reception. And I'm standing there saying, yeah, right. Like they're going to listen to her, like they're going to go into reception. Well, oh, yes, they did. Got off the rumble, rumble disappeared. Poor squidgy child pulled out <laughs> from underneath, glad to be alive. <laughs> Taken into reception. So I follow behind, surreptitiously as you do, get into reception, and when everybody's gone through, I then say to the receptionist, who was that, um, that woman who came out and sorted out the rumble in the playground, gave me her name and said she was a teaching assistant. That was my start at St. Bonaventure's. Teaching assistant, deputy head, IT technician, didn't matter who you were. If you turned up to work at St. Bonaventure's, A, you knew that you had agency, irrespective of how much you were paid or what your job title was, that you were respected for what you did, that you would be backed up in terms of what you did, because she knew that if those boys had just run off, all she had to do was go into reception, give them the names, and they would have been hauled out of their lessons. It was a tight family type of environment where everybody contributed to making it what it was. Yeah. Nobody's asleep. No. Some people look like they're dribbling, <laughs> but I'm going to overlook it. It's a 15 year plan. Imagine 15 years in this country without interruption in terms of educational policy. I dared to suggest this at the Leeds Summit. I was doing a keynote presentation and I said, look, one of the things that some of the nations that we don't look at, because Jamaica isn't on one of the PISA tables, it's not one of the OECD nations, that you know, we, we keep hearing about Korea and Finland and blah, blah, blah. Well, three quarters of the planet isn't on those 
You know, there's, there's, there's other, the entire African continent doesn't exist. Neither does South America, neither does India, and neither does most of China, with the exception of a couple of cities. They're not on those tables. Yet these are the places that we're supposed to be competing with. Yes? And we're not looking at what they're doing in terms of their education system? Well, anyway, let's look at Jamaica. And what Jamaica has said is, if the purpose of education is about nation building, then irrespective of which party you come from, that's the transformation agenda that we've all signed up to, cross-party agreement. I think that's a very mature way to look at education. Anyway, I, you know, you're all nodding wisely, and rightly so. <laughs> at the lead summit, it was, oh, no, 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 no. In fact, one of the politicians on the stage said to me afterwards, he said, uh, no, he didn't. He said, at the time when I said it, well, if we all agreed, how would people know who to, who to vote for? The talk in the staff room was the reason that some kids weren't coming to school on time at the beginning of the school year was that their parents couldn't be asked. They don't value education. And I thought to myself, well, maybe some of them don't, but not the vast majority. Our uniform, thankfully, in the school where I was head, was black and white. These days, you can buy cost price from the same place that Tesco buys theirs from, and you can sell it to your parents. They can pay for it, take as long as they like. Their kids can be in school with everybody else's kids. So I said to the Parent Teacher Association, that's what we're going to do. Kids were in school on time. It's a different mindset, you know? And that's why remembering who we are and where we've come from is really, really important in the way that we deal with other human beings.